So yeah, hi, I'm Jeremy, and I'm a staff engineer with the O0 platform team. Hi, my name is Kahao. I'm a principal engineer in Auth0 platform team. Uh, thank you for joining with us today. Uh, we are excited to share how we manage and upgrade hundreds of Kubernetes cluster daily without any service interruption. Okay, so let's go through the agenda first. So we will talk about the context and our challenges. Then we will briefly introduce our platform. And then we will spend a large chunk of time to talk about our solutions. Finally, we will talk about some outcome and the result. Last but not least, we will have a Q&A section. So um, our OCO platform has two offerings. We have a public cloud offering, which is a um, multi-tenant, multi-subscriber, and it supports multiple customers per environment. Also, we have a private cloud offering, which, has, uh, which is dedicated for one customer per environment, and we have hundreds of them across the world. On top of that, for the private cloud, it also runs on different cloud provider. Currently, it runs on AWS and Azure as well. So um, with a big picture of like, how many clusters that we spend globally, right? So uh, let me summarize like, how we, like, what's the management challenge that we face daily. So first, as I mentioned from the previous slides, we have hundreds of environment and we are globally distributed. And also, we have hundreds of deployments that happen daily and they happen like 24 hours 7. And each customer environment, uh, they are different. Like they have different infrastructure size, like they have different Kubernetes size, different DB size, and they run on different application stack that serve different purpose, and they are multi cloud as well. And also, we need to like, make sure that uh, our infrastructure version is always up to date. So let's say right, EKS released a new Kubernetes version. We need to upgrade right away without any downtime. Finally, we need to have a constant security update. That means that our OS level and our application stack level security patch need to up to date right away. So I will pass it to Jeremy to introduce our platform. Thanks. So before we get into more technical details about our deploy strategies, we wanted to quickly go over our platform, as just to give you some important context about what we built. So our platform runs O0 for all our customers. It unifies many different customer offerings into a modern, automated, and scalable platform that is built for the future. Our goals were to increase uh, business agility, developer productivity, scalability, reliability, and security by using uh, industry-leading tools and fully automated operations. So, like we mentioned, our platform is multi-cloud, so currently we support AWS and Azure. It is uh, container orchestrated. All our services run inside Kubernetes clusters. It's uh, stateless, so all the components are scalable and replaceable by design, including whole Kubernetes clusters. It is uh, immutable, so it only runs trusted code and configuration. It is fully automated, so the provisioning, upgrades, and decommissioning are all done by machines. We also slightly rely on GitOps, so our GitHub releases are used as a source of truth. Our platform is not only used by our customers, we also use it internally for many of our tools and services. So that's a very high-level view of the platform. So on one side, we have our control plane, which contains many different gRPC services and controllers, as well as an Argo workflows and Argo CD instances. On the other side, we have our customer environments in various regions and clouds. So to manage this, our control plane stores many entities in a database. They represent everything we deploy, from Kubernetes cluster configuration and secret values to actual uh, deployments. So in order to better manage those entities, we also maintain our own uh, Terraform provider. With it, we are able to do infra as code for all the objects that are managed by the platform. And we also maintain our own set of customized plugins 
This is to allow our service owners an easy way to generate Kubernetes manifest that will follow all of our best practices. So at first, we used a traditional rolling deployment on the first iteration of the platform. It meant we could have two versions serving traffic at the same time. So in case of an issue with the new version, it can actually reduce our capacity. And also rolling back is not trivial because we need to ensure that uh, both service versions are compatible with whatever infra version is at that time. It was also time consuming and had to be done by an operator manually with kube control. And at last with rolling deploy, as many of you know, it's really difficult to do no downtime Kubernetes version upgrades, as well as node base image, or just changing any of the configuration of new, your node pools. And also, uh, rolling deploy means that any secret rotation has to work on both clusters, on both versions of the infra. Thanks, Jeremy, for the platform introduction. So um, with the Boeing deployment, right, we know that some of the deployment requirement cannot be fulfilled because like, we always have two applications at the same time. So let's recap like, what we need to have for the, our deployment requirement. First, we need to have a low downtime during upgrade, and also we need to have fast rollback during the incidents. Also, we have an important feature called auto, automated size change. That means for our customer environment, they can upscale and downscale during our upgrade without any downtime. And also, I like we have a seamless infrastructure version upgrade as well. That also leads to support low downtime. So with a low out-of-box solution, off sale platform team implement a solution called Webpack Deployment. So what is a Webpack Deployment? So basically, we create a brand new Kubernetes cluster for every deploy that we occur in each customer environment. I mean environment, sorry. So as you can see from the diagram, right, on the left side, Let's say like in, initially, we only have a old cluster running, which is the black cluster in there, and it's serving traffic. So let's say a deployment occurs, our control pane will create a brand new Kubernetes cluster with the related infrastructure, which is the red cluster on the left side. Then our control pane will launch a couple workflow that will install the new application stack on the new cluster, and it will run the system test across, um, against the new cluster. So if the cluster is running up and health, healthy and then the system test pass, then we will update the DNS switch by pointing the traffic to the new cluster. So after that, we will delete the old cluster along with the old application stack and then declare the deployment as verified. So it require, it, as I said, right, it requires a lot of steps, but actually our Webpack deployment is 100% automated with that low downtime. So, um, in order to achieve that, uh, there are several areas that we need to focus on during the implementation. So first, we have a set of well thought control pane data model that drive the whole deployment lifecycle. Also, we have a very consistent release pipeline and definition. And on top of release, there is low impact on the secret and config update across releases. Lastly, we also have a fine control workflow orchestration that handle like different incident scenario. So um, let's focus on the control pane data model definition first. So basically, we abstract everything, such as the customer environment, Kubernetes cluster, um, config and secret that the microservice need as a data model objects that the control pane can understand. By the control pane, I don't mean like what Jeremy introduced like those microservices that drive the deployment logic, right? It also includes a Terraform plugin that we implement. So basically, the Terraform plugin can consume the object and it can create a correlated um, infrastructure or update it or delete it based on the object state. And our home group, uh, customized plugin can also consume the um, uh, data model object and render the appropriate manifest to install our application, uh, application correctly. So finally, uh, our, we also map the Kubernetes object to the application, uh, to the Argo CD application, such that, like, for example, if we create one uh, Kubernetes cluster 
we will also like to create one Argo CD application to install the stack on top of it. So um, regarding to the release pipeline, we have a very consistent release pipeline. So um, our release pipeline is called release channel. So a release channel is basically um, uh, a pipeline that the, customi uh, the customer environment can fall into. And then like different release channel um, use different release. And our deployment must target to like at, uh, one release. And our release is based on something called release manifest. So what is a release manifest? It's basically a complete description of the following items, such as the microservice, infrastructure change, um, Kubernetes manifest change, and customized changes. So let's say if one of the item, above item change, our control plane will create one release, and this release can be deployed to the customer environment. So with the concept of the release channel, release manifest, it gives us a very consistent view of what gets deployed to different customer environment, and then we can backtrack on like, what's wrong with each environment by looking into like, each release, what gets changed, something like that. Thanks. So in the previous slides, we mentioned a few times uh, configs and secret values. And so we handle them a bit differently as well. So the, for, at first, what are they used for? So typically, the microservices will require configuration or secrets to function properly. The configs and secrets are generated by uh, Terraform during the infra provisioning phase. They are generated either by our own uh, Terraform plugin or by any of the third party providers we use. So they will be based on uh, infra information, for example, a database endpoint, a three bucket name. But sometimes they are also generated directly by our services uh, to share secret values between services, for, for instance. So what happens if a secret or a config value changes uh, and works only on one specific version of infra? Then uh, we need to make sure that this will not cause any issue if we need to roll back the cluster. And so to solve this problem, we have uh, the concept of uh, config snapshots and secrets. So basically, a uh, config snapshot or secret is um, a specific value for a specific customer for a specific release version. And so since each cluster will tie to a specific release, then we know that during every deployment, we always have that snapshot to fall back to. And this is like a very crucial step in our release automation. Thanks, Jeremy. So let's deep dive into our deployment uh, workflow. So um, we have a very fine control like deployment workflow to support like different incident scenario. But first, let's focus on our happy path that doesn't have any deployment failure. So let's say a release is created from the release pipeline, and then our deployment scheduler in the control pane detect a new release. Deployment scheduler will create a new deploy to the controller. So controller will submit a couple Argo, CD, Argo workflow, and the work, first workflow will be a provisioning workflow. So the responsibility of this workflow is to provision the new Kubernetes cluster along with all the related infrastructure, and also it will create all the necessary config and secret that the microservice need. Then when the infrastructure provisioning is done right, this workflow will also ask Argo CD to sync the new application stack against the new cluster. And then this workflow will also launch a system test to test against this cluster. And then if everything is fine and happy, then control pane will launch a promoting workflow. So for this workflow, it do a couple of things. The first thing, it will do a DNS switch, and it will switch the traffic by pointing to the new cluster. And also make sure that like, the old cluster doesn't have any pending active connection before we move forward. So once we know that like, the old cluster is, has nothing to do with the release, then the control pane will submit a cleanup workflow. So what this workflow does is that it will just do the cleanup, like clean up the old cluster, clean up the Argo CD application stack, and then we will declare the deployment as verified and finish. So we also need to support a rollback use case. So let's say deployments happen, we upgrade in customer environment, and then something happened, right? And then I incidents occur, SRE is page, and then I SRE see that what happened, and then I will just start the rollback operation. 
At that time, Control Pink will submit a couple rollback workflow. The first workflow will be a rollback traffic workflow. So what does this workflow does? It's basically you just pawn the traffic back to the old customer, and the turnaround time is less than 10 minutes. And the main idea of this workflow is to mitigate the any downtime on the customer side so that we can like, extend our investigation. So once we know that the traffic pointing to the old customer, then, the, then we can start investigating like, what's wrong with the new customer and see like, if we can fix it. So let's say if we cannot fix it, and then we can declare it's a full failure, SLE can resume the full, full rollback, and control pane will submit a rollback cleanup workflow. This workflow will remove the, any failed infrastructure, including the failed Kubernetes cluster and also the failed Argo CD application. And we will declare this upgrade is failed. Also, we need to handle a false alarm use case. So let's say, right, like SLE is page, and then SLE submit a rollback workflow, and then control pane switch the traffic back to the old cluster by running the rollback traffic workflow. At that point, incident response step in and look into the new cluster and found that, oh, like it's a false alarm, it's okay to upgrade. What, what, we, what he will do is that he tell SLE that, like, oh, you can go ahead and retry the promotion. And then SLE will submit a retry promotion operation to a controller. Controller will submit a retry promotion, I mean the promotion workflow. This workflow is just the same as the happy path that it will pawn the cluster, pawn the traffic back to the new cluster. So from this diagram, right, I haven't, I, I didn't I mention that like, after the promoting workflow, you also want the cleanup workflow and you will delete the, the old cluster and declare the upgrade is finished. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, that was the high level view of the red black deploy strategy. So once we had a good first version and we started using it, we had some additional considerations to take into account. So first of all, we need to ensure we have enough capacity after the DNS switch. We also need to ensure we have no data loss when we switch from the old to the new cluster. We need to take into account some specific edge cases, such as uh, singleton services. And since the clusters are ephemeral, uh, we need to have a new requirement that all components in the cluster need to be stateless. Uh, also, this allowed us to build some extra features on top of Red Black, such as the traffic segmentation to slowly roll out releases on our public cloud environment, cluster overlapping period, which is used in some edge case scenarios where we need extra reliability, and at last, the no downtime secret rotation. So for the capacity issue, uh, so the, the main problem is that when we do the DNS switch, the black cluster, so the old cluster, is serving traffic up until the point we start the DNS switch process. And since we use horizontal pod autoscaling and cluster autoscaling, it means that up until that point, we cannot be sure what uh, actual node size and replica accounts are in the cluster. So what we do is right before the DNS switch, we will copy over uh, the replica accounts from the old cluster to the new cluster. So we will use the old cluster replicas as the new cluster current and minimum replicas. Once the deployment is finished, we will reset the HPA to the default values, and from now on, we just let it handle uh, scale as usual. We apply the same logic on the node sizing, where we copy the node desired and min count from the old to the new cluster. So for the data loss, uh, so we have a few async tasks that are running in the cluster, such as uh, message queue. And we also want to make sure before we switch to the new cluster that everything is ready to go in there. So for that, we mainly use polling. And so we emit a data dog matrix, um, matrix to data dog in our control pane. And so what we do is that we have uh, basically two steps in our workflow to poll a cluster and check some metrics. So before we do the DNS switch, we will pull the new cluster and make sure all the HTTP endpoints are ready to accept connections. And before we start the cleanup workflow, we will pull for metrics such as uh, in-flight messages and connection counts on some other endpoints. And so what we do is that we wait until those metrics reach the numbers we want, 
And when they do, we just move on to the next step. Uh, so singleton services is mainly an issue due to some legacy services. So once upon a time, we had services that had re exclusive, re exclusive access requirement to that, to that, ah, to database. <laughs> Uh, so it means that uh, those services cannot run in two clusters at the same time, even if the cluster is not serving actually any traffic. So to fix that, we provide our service owners with a specific customized annotation they can use. So like we mentioned earlier, the service owners will use our customized plugin, which exports many customized generators that they can use to generate nice Kubernetes manifest. And so one such annotation is a singleton service annotation. So they will indicate that their service needs to run exclusively in one cluster. And what we do is during the automation, uh, after the Argo CD sync and before the Argo CD sync, we will check for all the singleton services. And those services are scheduled on the new cluster, at first with uh, zero replica. And once the sync is done, we will copy over the replica count from the old to the new cluster. We will scale it down on the old cluster and we will scale it back up on the new cluster. Thanks, Jeremy. So, um, canary traffic routing. So, as I mentioned before, right, during the deployment life cycle, we promote the traffic as an point of the promoting workflow. So, um, basically, when we switch the DNS, it's not only one record, but it includes like, a lot of records, and each record includes a lot of tenants. So, um, controlling has an option to slow down, speed up, or do a bulk DNS update during the promotion. So why we to do it? Because we need to like reduce the bus radius like on some sensitive deployment. So let's say right, like release a very sensitive release on the on the new cluster and we want to closely monitor it. We want to slow down the DNS um, traffic segmentation and try to see if everything works fine. If something happened, right, then the bus radius is reduced and then we can do a bulk update to roll back the traffic while right way to the old cluster. Similarly, we have a cluster overlapping feature. So imagine, like we finish the deployment, the old cluster is gone, and then the incident start right after the deployment is gone. So the action item is that like we need to patch or make a new release and then do another web back deployment, which takes a lot of time. So this option allows the both cluster coexist at the same time, even up to several weeks. So that means that like if like um, something happened, right? Then we can move back the traffic right away without really doing a new deployment. But then, like this feature, pay a price because like with two Kubernetes cluster running, um, it's expensive in like all the car providers, so we only do it in like some special environment such as all our public car environment. So as far as uh, observability, uh, like I mentioned, we use Datadog and we have instrumented our platform to emit metrics on many different events. For example, our deploy managers will emit metrics when we have a deploy success or a deploy failure. In addition to this, we will also leverage the metrics that are emitted by Argo workflows and Argo CD. So we combine all those metrics into dashboards for the SREs and operators to consume. Uh, these dashboards can be used to troubleshoot deployment issues. And we also have alerting set up on some metrics so for example, we have dashboards for step uh, space deployment steps duration, uh, reliability of specific steps, uh, and deployment success and failures. And for incidents, we have a good example would be that we have a, a, a trigger incident when many deployment failures events occur at the same time, which is usually indicative that there is an issue with one of our third party providers. So these metrics are not only used for troubleshooting purpose, we will also use them to improve our platform. So we will use them to improve our scaling, we will use them to improve our deployment speed, etc. So now that we went over the deploy strategy, we can share some of the outcomes of that work. So first of all, we improved our security posture, which is very important for us. So we have no friction when we need to update uh, the Kubernetes version or the OS uh, base image operating system version, as well as any of the internal cluster components. It also gives us a really nice uh, safety net. So when we do the red back deployment, 
we always have a cluster to fall back to, and we always wait until the last point before we switch cluster traffic to the new cluster. So for example, when we had the big outage this summer uh, on Azure uh, environments, in our case, we just have a bunch of failure, deployment failures, but we had actually no impact on our live traffic. This also means, no. yeah. So with uh, Redback deploys, we are able to scale up and down our clusters from node types and counts to service replicas. And so we have specific size defined for specific customers. Having a low friction way to scale our node size means we are able to adopt a very wide range of cluster sizes. So we go all the way from two small, um, two small nodes uh, spot instances to 250 nodes on our larger clusters. The safety of the deploy strategy means we can iterate quickly on our releases. So we have an average uh, 100 releases per day. And when there is an issue on the new cluster during a deployment, we have no incentive to fix it fast. We can take our time to properly troubleshoot this issue. And in some scenarios, we actually keep the failed cluster around for a long period of time, just to give us time to properly troubleshoot, even like raise tickets with our cloud providers. So um, we implement Webpack deployment and also we have working deployment since day one, right? Then the question comes is that like, do we need to use both? The answer is yes. But by default, we use Webpack deployment for all our customer environment. Um, we still use working deployment in several situations, such as the time sensitive hotfix, any minor microservice patches, or any like testing environment for developer to do their microservice testing. So overall, like, um, the rule of thumb is that like, if the deployment doesn't involve any downtime, you just use rolling, especially for local environment. Otherwise, we just use Webpack for our, all our like, customer environment. OK, any question? You uh, partially answered it in that last slide, but I'm curious how the hundreds of deploys a day lines up with the two hour time to healthy and the multiple overlapping clusters at a time. So 100 deploys across all customer. So one customer do one deploy like at least once a week. So oh, okay. we have like hundreds okay. of like environment, right? So like if you average it out, like hundreds of customers will do like upgrade daily. And then, as I mentioned, right, we have the release channel. The release channel is a scheduler control like which customer environment do like on Monday, Tuesday, something like that. So add up is like 100 per, 100 slide per, per day, something like that. So does it answer your question? Yeah, it does. Yeah, Thank you very okay. much. Yeah, I was uh, curious about the, the stateless thing. I mean, you are in control of all the application running on, on the clusters because you cannot really know if they have volumes, for example. I, I then, can't hear you, sorry. Like, can you? Ah, sorry. <laughs> so if the downstream cluster, so the, the one that you are upgrading with this red-black um, approach, have volumes, this will not work, right? You want to answer? Sorry, I, I didn't I, get the first I couldn't answer. hear, like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so <laughs> the, um, the fact that if you have a persistent volumes in the yeah. cluster, how yeah, do yeah, you yeah. manage okay. that? Okay, so yeah, as Jeremy mentioned, our application is stateless. So like the only stateful set is the tier 3 application that one that consumes the rapid MQ, which is also local. But all the tier 1, T0 servers, they are all stateless. The requirement is that like, they need to be stateless, so they're like both clusters and standing. So for all the legacy applications that, that was implemented before Webpack was involved, they used they to use the singleton surface. That means that they need to scale down and then scale up across the cluster, something like that. So yeah. Yeah, but the requirement is that like, like everything needs to be stateless. So yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, for your uh, new deployments for the, onto the new clusters, uh, how do you deal with uh, pod disruption budgets uh, for certain applications? Uh, that, that, come, that, that come with the, our customized plugin. So our customized plugin, basically we call it application X. All the microservices need to follow that blueprint to use that, and then our, our, our customized plugin 
will estimate like uh, the will have the PDB at minimum PDB that like um, need to have for different type of server something like that. So they cannot like randomly craft a manifest and then deploy to it. We, we don't allow it. Like we need to have a something called uh, we call it application X service, and then I really need to go for our customized plugin to render it. So yeah, that's 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 what that's what I call it. Like we do a fine control on everything, mm. so that we have low downtime. So. Mm -hmm. okay. So, so you basically control how apps are completely like there's very little room for the app developers to do kind of what they want on this platform. Is that correct? In yeah, like of? like um, like we to see like what kind of service they want, right? And then like we to we to like consult with them like like if your service is T1, then we to allocate more resources for mm -hmm. that, and we to allocate more PDB for that. Otherwise, if it's T3, yeah, it. It allow like then we can allow like you have low T PDB, but yeah, but it depends on surface by surface. So, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. So, uh, if I'm following your in your overall like process, um, my question is around how your Terraform interacts with sequencing of the work. So you're bringing up. Kubernetes nodes, they have to have privileges to get started. You probably don't want them running with the same privileges. How do you basically protect your, uh, your Kubernetes stuff from, or your overall infrastructure from a, like, things that need to be done sequentially in Terraform? Uh, I don't quite, quite follow like, uh, what you mean by the, by the sequence and the, uh, um, what's the first word, like the sequence? So uh, the idea is like when you bring your cluster up, it has mm -hmm. to have extra permissions to get started and initialize, uh -huh. and then you don't want it necessarily running with those same root level permissions after the fact. How do you deal with that with your infrastructure so, as code? Yeah, so when, when, we generate, when we create a Kubernetes cluster, we have uh, used, uh, for example, EKS, we use the uh, AWS off, and that one will, will generate a template and then install in the EKS um, cluster. So that one is basically a blueprint that I determine like, uh, what, type, uh, what kind of level that they can access. So, uh, for example, our platform team has an admin access for the EKS cluster, but for the developer, they don't have it. But the magic only happen um, is in the, during the Terraform phase, we consume the data model, and then we look at the state and generate the um, AWS of template and then install to it, then we can control the access, something like that. Uh, okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you concerned with the capacity limitations of cloud environments? Sorry. When you, you, sorry. <coughs> Are you concerned with capacity in cloud environments by doing a red-black deployment, especially for some of your larger customers? I could imagine you might have hundreds of nodes and suddenly you need to duplicate the number of nodes given your HPA's minimums are going up. Are you concerned, or how do you mitigate the risk of a cloud provider running out of capacity with this model? You mean, do you mean like the, can you answer? Do you, want to answer? Uh, do, do you mean like uh, quotas in what, whatever uh, nodes are available? Yeah, EC2s, uh, if C6s run out, and then you're on different, particular, different types of hardware, are you concerned about, or how do you mitigate those kind of capacity constraints with this model? So. So sometimes we do have transient issues with a specific knob type not being, not being available, and in this case, we will have just a deployment failure that we can roll back and try again next week or next day. Yeah, uh, in, and, and also, like, um, in Terraform, we can provide a list of instant type that can support, right? Like, if something is not available, we use the backup. And also, there's an interesting um, topic, though, right? We recently used the ARM, upgrade everything ARM, before we roll it out, right, we need to talk to AWS to see if that region has enough ARM capacity in order to roll out that region. So like, we do really fine control on, like, like, for example, like this customer is on US East 1, to then really to make sure that they have enough ARM instant, then we can enable ARM, something like that. So yep. yeah, yeah. But we always have a backup in the Terraform to say that if ARM not available, use like AMD, like for large for that low group, something like that. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. I, I had two questions. That was my first one. So yeah, shortcut. <laughs> so my second question is still on the same, on the same topic. Uh, you said you do hundreds of deployments per day. 
So do you, do you create some sort of a limits on how many deployments any given application can do per day, or uh, do you create queues? How do you manage that? So um, we have something called deploy window. Like the deploy window is to, um, to restrain like for, for several hours, right? We can only deploy like 70 environments, something like that. And also our controller has a uh, prioritized loop saying that like um, uh, we can only deploy 30 of them, like, and then if we finish all 30 of them, then we can do the next 30, something like that. The reason is that like uh, we use Argo workflow and Argo CD, and we don't want to stretch Argo CD. So we want to like, and you can see like we have two million Kubernetes resources, right? If you stretch Argo CD, Argo CD will crash. So we want to like, like do a prioritized loop and make sure that all 30, 30 of them install a stack and then go to the next 30, something like that. So that means when, in your first slide when you said you had a controller, a controller cluster, you only have one controller yeah. cluster for all yeah. of that? Yeah. That's yeah. brave. Yeah, but thanks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, 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 yeah, we are a very good programmer and then optim optimize everything, so yeah. <laughs> uh, how do you handle switching over like background workers and Kafka consumers and non, essentially non HTTP workloads. I, I can't. Yeah. How how do you ha handle switching like the switch over between the red and black clusters for non HTTP resource uh, workloads like Kafka consumers, etc. Um. So, the we only switch the edge, right? The edge is always HTTP. So we we don't have like gRPC. Do we, have, we don't have gRPC, like we don't have it. Like, it's just yeah, HTTP, yeah. But I mean, like background workers that huh? don't get like incoming requests that are like pulling from a queue or consuming from Kafka. Um, yeah, singleton, right? Like we have a singleton service that, like, for any tier three service, like we have a singleton to make sure that, like, the only the old cluster is running or the new cluster is running, something like that. So okay, yeah. mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned your release manifest includes uh, versions of microservices, but you might also do rolling deployments of microservices. How do you make sure the deployments kind of stay in sync and, and use the, are always deploying the latest version of every service? Do you want to answer that? Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no. Can you repeat it? Yeah. Sorry. Um, so if, if your release manifest has uh, specific versions of each microservice, yes. but you might also do a rolling deployment of a microservice, Yes. How do you make sure that whatever's released is always the latest version? Uh, so we have a release pipeline called CSP, and then the CSP will just like scan through all the microservices repo and then grab the new version and we'll update the release manifest. Yeah, so it's basically the release manifest is a mono repo that describes all the microservices that point to different repo. And then we have a automation called CSP, and then it will scan like if surface, microservice one make a new release, then the robot, right, GitHub, we have a robot you know, to talk to GitHub and then update the release manifest and then check it in automatically. So, so, so yeah, so this process, we make sure that like, yeah, we always have the up-to-date um, release version, so. Mm -hmm. So will that always create a new release manifest uh, when you start a rolling deployment or at the end of a rolling deployment? I don't get what you mean. Uh, uh, is that about uh, GitHub's? So we don't really like we don't really update our environments when we get new commits in Git. So we follow GitOps in the sense that we will use a GitHub a release tag as a version that we deploy in our clusters, but we will not uh, redeploy a version if a new service uh, is updated. And so some customers who are more risk averse will want an update uh, that is that has soaked for three weeks across all other environments. And for like our public cloud environment, we will update it multiple times a day as new service versions comes up. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, hi. Thanks for the talk. Uh, two questions. So you talk about black, uh, black red deployment. Is it different from uh, more used like blue green deployment? Or is it the same? Uh, what what the like uh, is it same as blue green deployment or I never heard of that. Like you talked about red black. Uh, uh, 
Depends like how you describe what is blue. I mean, it's, it's just a name, call, I guess. We call blue green as bowling. It's just a name, right? Uh, yeah, we call blue green as bowling, but some people call blue green as red. Okay, yeah. yeah. That's what I thought is the same, pretty yeah, yeah, much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, second yeah. question is, I think, more detailed. The, uh, what I understand, you are using the same process for even cluster upgrades, like we are going from 130 to 131. You will use the same process, right? Yeah. Okay, exactly. Right, yeah. And uh, uh, since it's a like, big change, uh, could be application, could be the cluster, do you test uh, following the same process in your like, UAT environment, or you follow some different process? We do the it? same process. Like, yeah. Whenever upgrade, we just like do the web back, one system test, make sure, she, make sure the new cluster is working, then we cut over. Yeah. So it's always the, the same. We have low special. In the test environment, yeah. you use the same process? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Black, red. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. So my question was, um, what do you do for DNS, like for an ingress resource uh, on the cluster? Like, how do you handle those? The DNS on what? Sorry. Like, if I have an ingress resource K8, how do you migrate it over to this other cluster? The ingress resource on the old cluster. How do I migrate to the new cluster? Is that what you mean? Right, yeah, like if you're duplicating the whole cluster, I have yeah. an ingress resource, like what do you do to actually? So they are two different NLB. So the old cluster spin up an ingress with one NLB, and then the new cluster spin up an R ingress with an R NLB. So the DNS is pointing to the NLB, it's not pointing to the ingress. So, so. like you don't use external DNS or anything like that? Like, 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 no. What do you do for the actual like records in DNS? Yeah, yeah, the records in DNS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So those are manual. You, do you manually create those? Like no, who? no, it's like automation. Like you just use API to. So so the ingress controller in Kubernetes. I mean the external DNS can program the the, the record right to the DNS uh, provider. But then after that, we can ha we have the API to update that to update that record to pointing to the to the um, uh, to the new cluster, yeah. There are a couple layers, like, I, I can't tell you that, like, what layer it is, but yeah, but the, the top layer that touched the edge, we, we manage it, we don't use the external DNS managers, but, the, but below that, right, like, we have two exactly same Kubernetes cluster, along with the NLP that pointing to the edge, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's like, yeah, it's yeah. like abstracted out that you, you don't actually, like, you don't actually handle the records and stuff, like, it'd be, it'd be higher up kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much.